Hello, everybody. How you doing? Let's see. Let's run an audio test here. Madeline, let me know if I sound okay. We're going to go into second, guys, here. Just going to do an audio test. Madeline, just type in if you can hear me okay. So go ahead and start typing your questions in in the chat, and I'm going to answer them. My name is Andrew Kraus. I co-founded InventRight with Stephen Key over 20 years ago. Yeah, 20 years ago. It's been a really long time. And we've been coaching and mentoring inventors ever since. Oh, Madeline's saying she doesn't hear my audio. Okie dokie. Uh, let's see. How about now? Yes? Okay. Good. You got audio then. Okay, great. Um, so go ahead and, and type your questions into the chat box. Uh, we've been doing this. I, I don't know. I've lost track. I think it's the eighth or ninth time we've been doing this um, since COVID came about. And you guys are loving it. I'm loving it. You guys have great questions. And uh, I think I have pretty decent answers. You can let me know if you don't, if you disagree. Um, but uh, I want you to type your questions in the chat box. I'm going to answer them. As you probably know, um, Steve and myself in EventRight, we coach and mentor people to license their products, which means sell your idea for royalties. And so the big company, they're going to manufacture it and market it and put all their money in and use their workforce and tap into their existing distribution. That is the one of the biggest things when you're licensing is tapping into existing distribution. So if they were doing a kitchen gadget, and they're in Walmart and Target and Bed Bath and Beyond and Walgreens and Rite Aid. Well, then you're in all those places and your product is one of, let's say, 50 of their products or 100 of their products. And you're tapping into that existing machine. And that's the big benefit of licensing. You're not asking companies to go out and start a whole new division or a whole new company. You want to tap into what they're already doing. And so when you look for potential licensees, you want to find licensees that are um, selling similar products and the distribution channels that you want to be in. Um, and that's very, very important. Um, last week we did, we focused on fears and concerns, things that were holding you back. So um, I asked you guys all to think on that. And if you have any of those types of questions, um, hey, I thought on it some more. I still have some other fears and concerns that you didn't address. But you guys can ask any question with regards to uh, licensing or inventing in general, and I will answer it. Um, let's see, let me pull this up. Okay, let's get going. Uh, Chad, uh, thanks Chad for the question. I spoke with an IP attorney, that's just a patent attorney guys. If you say IP, it sounds fancy. It means intellectual property, which could be patents, copyrights and trademarks, but makes you sound fancy, right? Which is cool, Chad, that's a good thing. Um, spoke to an IP attorney a few days ago, and by the end of our hour-long conversation, he said he would like to invest. Is this common? Should I be wary? He is a company, accomplished, an accomplished attorney of 23 years. Um, I think it's a little odd. I think the average patent attorney doesn't have a lot of business savvy. I think it's very flattering um, that he wants to invest. now. If your business model is to license, you don't need investment because when you license, that big company is going to provide you the money, the workforce and the existing distribution because you're going to license it to them, move on, and they're going to sell it and they're going to pay you a royalty every quarter. So, you know, that wasn't really your question, Chad. You know, I mean, it, it, but it's, it's flattering. Um, you can let him know that your business model is to license and so you don't really need investors. Um, if for some reason, most of the time our students don't need this, but if for some reason it required an expensive prototype and you wanted him to invest in that prototype and then share a percentage of your royalties when you license, um, you could do something like that. Um, I, I don't know exactly, to be honest with you, what the rules are for patent attorneys um, becoming partners. I, I've heard of it happening. Um, now, if he's an accomplished attorney of 23 years, it should be very flattering 
Um, so I, I would just be flattered. I wouldn't really be that concerned about it. One funny thing that I can kind of share, because Steve and I have got to know patent attorneys over the years that I can share with you, um, is that quite often when you're a new patent attorney, people will hit you up. Inventors hit up patent attorneys all the time. Hey, you want to become partners? Do my patent for free? And usually only the uh, patent attorneys that are new uh, and, and young will do that. And then after a while, they'll stop doing that because, you know, they'll work really hard. They'll write the patent for the inventor and the inventor won't do anything with it. Most inventors file patents. They don't try to sell it. And they don't, they don't make any serious attempt to license it either. They just file patents. So after you can imagine if you're a new patent attorney, you did that six or seven times and not a single one of those inventors really made a serious effort to sell the idea. They would kind of bitter you on doing that work for free. So it's very rare that you'll find an experienced patent attorney that's willing to do that. Um, hey, more power to you. Find a green new patent attorney and they'll do it for a piece of any royalties you get. You know, hey, go for it. But realize that most of them won't take you up on that because they've been burned too many times. I, I hate to use the word burned, but it just wasn't productive for them. Um, so I, I really wouldn't be too concerned about that, Chad. I mean, if he's been in the business for 23 years, you have to figure out whether you want an investor, you know. Um, John says, I have a company that is very interested in my software idea. Is there a site or a company that I can reach out to to raise the funds I need to get the project going? Well, I don't understand that question because, again, we just talked about this, right? When you're licensing, you don't need funds. So why do you need funds to get the project going? The whole point of licensing is dumping the whole thing on them. So when you say of a company that's very interested in your software idea, if they're a software company and they have workers and they have money and they have existing distribution, why would you need to raise funds for that? That's my question. Um, so uh, Madeline, if, he, if uh, John follows up, if you could post that back in there and kind of grab my attention, we can do a follow up to that. So if you want to give me a an idea of who this company is, John, that would be, that would be very helpful. Um, Samuel, uh, Samuel says, hi, my name is Samuel. I want to know if I'm able to patent without an attorney. If yes, what is the website for that? Okay. There's a website for everything, right? Um, I think anybody that writes their own patent, Stephen and I both feel this way is, is insane. I've met a few people that have written their own patent and done a good job. I think they're few and far between. I would never, ever recommend somebody write their own patent. Writing your own provisional patent application, Samuel, is highly recommended because a provisional patent application, you, you notice how I use the word application, it's not a patent. So when you file a provisional application, it's a temporary placeholder that lets you say patent pending for an entire year, an entire year. So, and then if there's interest, get the company to pay for the patent, or if they're really interested, but they don't want to pay for the patent, well, now maybe you've got the interest, you've got a deal on the table. Now your risk is reduced substantially, so then you pay for a patent. So people always worry that the provisional is going to run out, but if you file a provisional and you know how to license and you start calling the very next day, you'll never need that whole year. I wouldn't say never. I'd say there are some really difficult projects, but maybe one or 2% of our students fall under those categories where it might linger for more than a year um, if you're doing everything right. Um, so uh, Samuel, I highly recommend you write your own provisional. We have software on our site called Smart IP. If you go to InventRight and you go to services, um, there's a software we sell for 99 bucks and you can file a provisional patent using that software. And then you just pay the patent office fee of 70 bucks. You still have to pay the patent office their fee of $70. And so now instead of paying $10,000 for the patent, you spent 70 bucks on a provisional patent. If you use their software, you're going to pay the other 99 bucks. Um, we developed that with patent attorney Gene Quinn. I think it's great software. The other tip that I'll give you is that the vast majority, 80% of following a good provisional is being an inventor. So if you decided this is what my idea is, you got to stop, put your feet up on the desk and go, how could I knock myself off and cover all the variations, workarounds, improvements in that provisional? So 
you can't be so narrow. You got to think about the other version that's 90% as good and include that in your provisional. So people worry do, about doing a good job with their provisional. That is the most important thing. Our software will help you with the wording and additional stuff. If you've ever looked at a patent, it's you're looking at it, it's like, what the hell is this? I can't do that. Well, that's not a provisional. You, you can write a provisional in common English. Now, there is a book, and I know him. His name is David Pressman, and he wrote the Nolo Press book, Patent It Yourself. I think it's an excellent book. David's an amazing guy. Um, and if you were crazy enough to write your own, that would be the book to follow. Um, I think it's a good book just to read, just to understand patents so you can talk to your patent attorney more. But you, it, with our invent right approach, you don't need that. You know, I mean, and it's, you're going to mess it up. You're just going to mess it up. It's, 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 it, that's really difficult. They have special examiners over there that will help pro se filers. A pro se filer is somebody that um, is filing themselves, but they will help you into a weak patent to get it done. And that's not necessarily what you want. So um, I don't, Stephen and I are not big believers in that. Filing your own provisional, yes. Filing your own patent, no. Um, but I've met a few exceptional people that I've seen do it. Um, uh, this one's from Jonathan. How do you feel about Quirky, the company that crowdsources ideas for manufacturing? You know, I, I, they've had, they went bankrupt and somebody else bought them. And then I think the CEO that was there, well, I forget what her name was. She left. I, I, I don't know the current status. I'm not going to comment on another company. My only comment is we believe in InventRight, that inventors should go directly to the companies they're going to license to. You don't need a go-between of any kind. And so... The whole crowdsourcing thing is weird to me. Um, Kickstarter, I I love the concept of Kickstarter, where you can get on Kickstarter, Indiegogo, and fund you starting your own business to make your product. And the grassroots nature of it is amazing. But in there, and it was really cool at the beginning. Now big companies are on there, like just as a promotional means. Um, problem is people are getting knocked off left and right there. People are seeing a campaign being fairly successful. And somebody, some butthead is knocking you off and selling it on Amazon before you even finish your campaign. So I don't like the exposure at all. Um, also, I've talked to people that are professionals at helping people with Kickstarter campaigns. And they say 90% of the people on Kickstarter and Indiegogo should not be on there. So people think, oh, well, I'll just go on Kickstarter. I'll raise the money. But the they're not wired up to run a company. So Getting $50,000 quite often, I mean, it can vary. I mean, you look at the people like this, they've got a new watch and they're highly technical, this smart watch, and they raised $4 million. Those are the outliers. And there's a reason why they raised it because they got their SHIT together, right? But the average person is not wired up to start their own business. You just aren't. And for, so this is where people fail on Kickstarter, Indiegogo. People fail to launch a proper social media campaign the problem is it's so crowded now that most people need to spend 20 to 40K just to pay people to run the social media campaign for them. Otherwise, they're just lost. Now, if you have a massive social network, then you can utilize that. Most people fall flat on their face just at the beginning, getting the word out with a Kickstarter Indiegogo campaign. Then the ones that raise some money, they fail to be able to manufacture it. Our IT guy, James, he used to do these all the time and he would fund these campaigns. And I, hey, James, you know that cool product you got there? Like, you know, from Kickstarter, how's that going? He's, he's like, oh, I still haven't delivered yet. I'm like, what? It's been like two and a half years. Are they ever going to deliver it? That's ridiculous. So people fail to be able to manufacture it. And then the ones that actually deliver the product to the people that ordered it, which is few and far between as far as I can tell, um, you know, they they don't go anywhere else after that. So, you know, is Bed Bath & Beyond going to be wowed that you raised $50,000 and got 200 orders on Kickstarter? Is that a reason for them to want to do business with you? A one SKU, one product company that isn't properly funded, has no track record, they'd rather buy from that vendor as 10, 20 products in their, at their store or, you know, and so when you license to that big company, when you're licensing, you are that big company. They don't think that you had a successful Kickstarter and everybody's going to beat a path saying, we want to buy from you because they know you don't know what you're doing. Now, 
at the same time, I've always like I always before I always like Kickstarter because it was so grassroots and so cool what they're doing. But it's not that anymore. It's not grassroots. People are knocking folks off left and right. There's scammers calling people on Kickstarter, offering them invention promotion services. Um, it's it's an absolute mess. If you ask me, I wouldn't recommend anybody to go on Kickstarter now. If you'd asked me two, three years ago, I wouldn't feel the same. But and then think about it. Am I willing to dump everything else I'm doing um, to run a business? Because people think, oh, if I just get the money, everything will fall into place. And it's so far from the truth. It's not even funny. So it's not just about the money. It's about so much more. It's about running the business. And you have to be more excited about running a business than about the product. It's very little to do with the product anymore. I'm saying that to exaggerate, to make a point. You got to, you know, you got to meet payroll. You got employees, you got contractors. You got a manufacturer's rep that says he's calling on these retailers and he's not. Then you got product coming in. You got to still got to pay the manufacturer in China and the product hasn't come in in time. And then it comes in all messed up. And then the retailer doesn't pay you for a while. I mean, God, I could go on and on with the problems there. I admire people that venture products, but it's problematic at best. Um, whereas when you license, all those issues are on them and they know how to handle it and handle it well. So thank you, Jonathan. Good um, it was just commentary on crowdsourcing in general. Uh, Matthew, uh, let's see. Hi, Andrew. Are there issues with creating prototypes with parts that already have their own patents? For example, building a prototype with parts from a hardware store. Um, you know, more than likely not most, most of the time, Matthew. I mean, if you, if it's including Velcro, I mean, if you see it, if you see it on products everywhere, um, you know, that might be just public domain. Like you can buy, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but you can buy Velcro is called hook and loop fastener. If you ever refer to Velcro in a patent, you can never use brand names. So you refer to it as hook and loop fastener. And I'm about 99.9% .9 sure there are other companies that essentially make Velcro. They don't call it Velcro because it's the brand name. But that's hook and loop fastener. So if you're like, oh, you know, I, I don't know, I, but I need to get permission from Velcro. No, you wouldn't because that's something that the manufacturer you license to can just put, purchase hook and loop fastener. They might be purchasing a generic version or the Velcro version, and they're going to add that to the product. So it's really such a general question that um, I can't answer it specifically, Matthew. But I what I'll say is most components and products are not patented. And so you can use these components from these other products quite often. Um, it depends, you know, but, and, you know, one litmus test, one crude way of looking at it is like, if you see it on a lot of different products, and especially maybe even other categories, it's probably not an issue. That's probably pretty much public domain. But yeah, if it has a patent and your product involves and has to use that patented component, um, more than likely, it's it's not like you're getting permission. You're, it's the manufacturer you license to is going to simply go buy from them, and they're happy with that. You know, so you know without getting the specifics, that's kind of a general answer. But I think that that pretty much answers it. Um, uh, frozen Frozen Guy RS. Okay, um, I in, I invented an engine with three times efficiency. My license royalty percentage won't be off the price of the whole car, correct? How does one begin to negotiate something without a clear price? Um, so that's a good question. So, you know, let's say these this company, it's a car company, and they're selling 400,000 cars a year, all right? And you've got this new engine they're going to integrate. Well, they're going to be integrating your new engine. Now, an engine's kind of a bad example because that's so dramatic. I mean, if you're licensing a, an engine that is three times the efficiency, let's say the car gets 30 miles a gallon, that's getting 90. That product is not the same product anymore. That is a product in and of itself. I don't care if they make 400,000 cars. That's a whole new product. So now it could be based on the improvement. It could be based on the whole price. But let's say you come up with something less significant, then you would have to negotiate how much value that adds. It's completely negotiable. I can't throw out uh, a figure. 
there. It's completely negotiable. Just get the interest. Don't worry about it. And when they ask you what you're looking for, you always say, well, what are you looking to do with it? Are they looking to do this small little test, sell it over here and here? Are they looking to blow it up big? So part of doing a licensing deal is understanding what they're going to do with it. So you would never bring up any royalty on any negotiation, let alone that one, without knowing what they're going to do with it. That's one thing, main thing that our negotiation coach Paul does. And inventors aren't analyzing, what percentage can I get? I'm like, well, you got to figure out what deals on the table. You obviously don't understand what deals on the table. So frozen guy, I can't answer your question because you don't know what kind of deal is on the table. But I can say if your engine has three times the efficiency, that's a whole new product. If it's just a little improvement, eh, it's not going to be on the whole product of selling massive volume of it. Now, what if they're selling very little volume of that product and now it blows up big? You know, it makes such a, it makes a, a, a difference. So. Um, hopefully that was helpful. It's not exactly specific, but a lot of licensing is gray. There are no rules. There are rules that we give our students, but you have to figure out what makes sense in the context of that project and that negotiation. Um, let's see. Next one is Star. Star Killer is your name. Okay. Um, hi, hi, Andrew. My name is Daniel. Oh, you gave your real name. Thank you, Daniel. Um, if you guys could do that, I'd appreciate it. Just give me your first name too, so I'm not using these silly handles. I have a design patent on a pet product, and my question is, do you think the current pandemic situation will make companies hesitant in licensing my new products? The feedback that we're getting, Daniel, um, is pet is big. Um, Lifetime Brands uh, came on. The president of Lifetime Brands came on, Dan Siegel, and he talked about how uh, new pet is huge. So pet is huge, new pet is huge. So people aren't even fully that much in pet or getting in pet. So that could be great. Are there, are there some pet companies that might be struggling? Sure. Uh, for the most part, I think what's happening is some of the smaller companies are struggling, but the bigger companies will come out of this stronger than ever. Um, so no, I, your question was, are companies hesitant to license any new products? Some are, most aren't. Um, we are not having our deals that our students are in fall off. I think what's going to happen, though, is these deals that our students are doing right now, there might be an additional four or five or six months before they launch the product. Um, but some of them, they already had budgets, so they'll keep that same budget and just plug it in and there won't be any delay. Um, so one thing that I'm always making clear to our students right now is that when companies say they're not interested, they'll quite often give you a generic, oh, not at this time, not a right match. And what some marketing managers are saying now, oh, no, because of COVID. And I know for a fact that some of them are saying that because that's true, usually a smaller company, or they're just personally managing some crises, or they're, they're managing lots of different projects, have lots of different bosses. So what I'm saying is, Marketing managers are saying that, but a lot of them, it's just a convenient excuse that people will accept instead of another excuse they would give if there was no COVID. Now, some of it's legit, but um, our students are able to get into companies easier than ever. I'm not kidding, because people are more responsive via email or paying more attention to their email or working from home. And um, they're more responsive on LinkedIn. So it's been great. We're getting more students signing up than ever. And our students are, are able to get into companies. Now, does that mean there's not going to be some companies that tell you they're panicking? Yeah, it's just a different thing to say. So it's to, to me, it's kind of a wash. I would say we're on the positive side for being able to license because you could approach 20 companies, our students do, 30 companies, and you maybe get a bunch of no's, get a bunch of no's because of COVID. But in the end, with licensing, all you ever need is one. And that fact the fact that you can get into people and talk to them a little bit more than you could before is helping our students do deals. So um, I would not hesitate whatsoever in working on your pet product. You're already invested in your provisional patent, so go for it. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Let's see. Mike says, what is the difference in royalties for design patent versus utility? None. I mean, if it has a benefit to them and they think they can market it, I don't think it should. 
have a difference. Um, I could see, you know, a company and medical devices or something might beat you up about that, but most of their categories, they don't, they don't, they don't care about patents to begin with a lot of them. And if they do, they quite often just like it as window dressing, patented, patent pending, and a lot of them will be okay with a design patent. So it doesn't make a difference in royalties, but for very patent picky, I never used that phrase before, for patent picky companies, they may not want to do a deal with you if you have a design patent only. But I, by and large, design patents can be very powerful. They can be extremely weak too. It depends on what you have there, Mike. But I don't think it'll affect the royalties. I think it might affect whether or not you can get a deal done with certain industries. Um, let's see. Uh, Chad says, I have an electronic Wi-Fi enabled device for the home, but I have no experience in building prototypes or electronic devices. How do I approach the company on the concept idea? I mean, just my knee-jerk reaction, Chad, is you shouldn't be working on that project. If you have no background or understanding of the technology you're developing, you shouldn't be working on that because you'll need to pay engineers a ton of money to explain it to the company. Now, if your piece of it is not require you to be tech savvy, great. But it, now, again, if you know if you know what change needs to be made for them to make it and you just can't make the prototype, that's fine. So just because you can't make the prototype, but if you know what change needs to be made and you're fairly certain the technology is there to make it, maybe just by looking at other products, then I, I'd say go for it. But if you're like, I think they should do this and I don't know how it would work. I don't remotely know how it would work. Well, uh, you're going to need to figure it out or you're going to need to move on to your next project. Um, hey, Andrew, when an idea is accepted by a company, what are some expenses I should be expecting during the licensing process? Example, patent attorneys or miscellaneous expenses. That's a great question, Raul. Um, so what are what, so he's asking after the product is accepted by the company. So when we help our students and we save our students tremendous amount of money by helping them through the negotiation, we're for most projects, we're helping our students get to 95% done. So our negotiation coach is helping the student go back and forth with the company. Students going back and forth with the con. Usually our coach, Paul, negotiation coach, will have them send, he'll ask the student to ask them to send their contract at the right point. And he'll go through it with the student. This is what's good. This is bad. This is missing. And this is what I suggest you go back to him and say. And you, the, our student doesn't have an attorney because they're not signing anything yet. So there's no risk there. And um, they'll go back to the, the company and say, oh, you know, and Paul might say, look, we got these five things that need to be fixed. And, you know, the student's like, oh, they're trying to rip me off. No, no, it's pretty normal. And there's about four things here that really need to be included, just missing. Are they trying to rip me off? No, 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 it's just normal, pretty common. And he might say, let's get everybody saying yes. Let's set them up with these three things and let's get them to agree. And then let's hit them up with these other things, very strategic. Whereas licensing attorneys can be very abrasive. And licensing attorneys, they, they will, as all attorneys do, nitpick things to death to get more billable hours. And so then what you have is them nitpicking it, which makes the company upset. And so quite often what you'll have is a dead deal and you'll still get the bill from the licensing attorney. But Andrew, it's a licensing attorney. They're the ones that do licensing contracts. Yes, they do. But they're not as adept at doing negotiations, many of them. <clears throat> and so we help our students to get to about 95% done. And we say, don't sign anything without a licensing attorney going over it. We, we have a licensing attorney that we know that only for deals that our students are working on with us because they're basically done. Paul will tell the student at some point, look, we've been going back for this company two months. This has everything important in it. Just have a licensing attorney dot the I's and cross the T's. And the licensing attorney we send people to, he, I think he does that for 350 bucks, which is cheap. But if you went to a licensing attorney for one deal, you could easily spend 3000 which is what we charge for our entire six months of help and boot camp and everything and sell sheets and absolutely everything. So, um, you know, uh, so that, you know, I would say that if you're doing it on your own, um, we always try, when our students get into a deal, our only goal isn't just to help them do that deal. 
It's to guide them through it so they know how to get to 95% done with the company themselves next time. So once you become empowered with that skill, you could have interest from six companies, talk to them all, and you're not paying some licensing attorney three, four, five hundred dollars an hour, which is a risk. So a lot of people know, oh, I love the provisional patent because I can get a provisional patent, see if there's interest, and not have to spend 10 grand on a patent. And that's great. And that's what we advise. But with a licensing attorney, if every time you get a little interest, like, oh, I need an attorney to help me close this deal and put the put, you know, put the screws to them. And no, that's not what you need. So um, I, I guess with that said, since you were asking about costs, um, who is, who is it? Who's it? who'd ask that question? Who asked that question? Let's see. Uh, oh gosh, so many questions came in. I lost track there. Uh, man, anyway, it doesn't matter. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I was trying to, there's too many questions there. Um, so you, with that, you would have, if you just, be very careful about just approaching a licensing attorney every time you get a little interest. I'm not biased, but we're going to do a much better job. Um, if you know somebody that's closed a lot of licensing deals, not one, because every licensing deal is different, you could rely on them. Um, if you go to a, a licensing attorney, you, you could be looking at, you know, two to $500 an hour. And that could get real expensive real quick, and it could be very unproductive. Um, so what other costs do you have once the company shows interest? Um, if they are putting things back on you, like let's say they don't want to make a prototype and you don't have one, or they want you to research further things, let's say they're being really difficult, they don't want their engineers to research something, and you need to hire an engineer to research it because you want to prove that it can be done, but they're skeptical. So there might be costs there. Those are costs I don't see our students incurring very often at all, but I want to cover everything that could happen. Um, but yeah, once you get interest, mostly the licensing attorney um, if you're with us, there's no additional costs. We don't charge people extra money while they're in a membership with us. Um, if there was any additional engineering that they didn't want to do, most of the time they're going to do that, though. They're better equipped to do that and get quotes and all that sort of thing. But there might be on more complex projects. They might want to put that back on you. But then you really want to qualify. Are they really interested? Because you don't want them to put that back on you. You go spend five grand doing a bunch of engineering work. You come back and you're like, nah. So you got to talk more about the product and the marketing and, and the deal itself before you go to, to spending a bunch of money. But at least you got some interest. Most inventors will spend all that money not knowing if they have any interest at all. They'll spend 10 grand on a patent and 8 grand on a prototype with no interest. There's no need for that when you're licensing the vast majority of the time, which is a beautiful thing. Um, okay. There's so many great questions here. Okay, that was a question was from Raul. Um, I figured that out. Let's see. Let's find somebody new here. Um, Gavin said, is enrollment to the IR boot camp immediate or are there delays wait and wait before officially starting? You know, usually we can get our new student up and running um, like the next day or the day after. Um, when our coaches... We have a new student. The coach will spend a full hour to do a download with a student and under, fully understand their project and their first steps. Um, right now, we're, we have a lot of people signing up. Um, we've been really booming the last uh, two, three months. Um, and so, you know, to be honest with you, Gavin, you know, you might you might need to wait five, six days now. Um, it, it depends also... All our coaches work different schedules. So what we do is we interview about what's your schedule that you work on, not just under COVID, but when you get out because you want it to work. And then so we pair you with a coach that works on the schedule when you want to meet with them. And then they're available. Our negotiation coach Paul's on call five days a week. Deals don't happen on the weekend, guys. They just don't. Um, uh, Carrie. Hey, yeah, Andrew, is it always that better to have a video or a sell sheet in order to pitch your idea? Yes, you should always have one of those 100% of the time. And the reason why, I mean, you've listened to us on the YouTube show, but the reason why is you don't need to be a salesperson. You just need to have the cojones to go out there 
and get your product in front of a marketing manager through LinkedIn or via the phone and via email and you send them your sell sheet or your video sell sheet. And that does the selling for you. And um, what I will say is I would say 95% of the students that come on board with us, many of them don't have a marketing piece, but the ones that do, literally 95% of them are not good enough. They're not, um, they might be okay. You don't want okay. You want, boom, I got it in six to 10 seconds. So a lot of times when you guys think your marketing materials are good enough, they're not. And our, our coach will uh, help you with that. Now, with that said, you could do it yourself. You can do the laptop test. You can put your video or your cell sheet on a laptop, sit at a desk with somebody you know, don't know, but you, you can never have talked to them about the idea before. Spin it around and look at their face and don't let them ask, ask questions. Don't say a damn thing and see if they're confused and see if they're getting it. So that's that's a cheaper way than doing our coaching. It's an alternate way that I'll give you. Um, it's it's pretty crude, but it, it, it can be useful. Um, let's see. But yeah, Carrie, you got to have a sell sheet or a video sell sheet. Um, it's your sales tool. You don't want to ramble on the phone or ramble via email. And whenever you send an email, it, it should not be longer than five, six sentences at most. I see inventors sometimes send these page long emails and it just makes me cringe. Our students would never do that. So, I mean, most of you listening probably know better, but some of you are like, whoa, what? I want to tell them all about me, Andrew. No, no. They have, you have six to 10 seconds. That is it. If you ramble, they'll be like, oh, this person might have a good idea, but I don't want to deal with them. They're not professional. They do not have the time. That's not the world we live in today. Um, it's not the world you live in. You wouldn't listen to somebody ramble either. Um, Paula, if you're starting with small means yet brilliant ideas, I love that, is legal backup necessary when attempting to license? How do you keep a company from treating you like a peon and taking advantage of you? I, I love that question. <laughs> Um, so Paula, how you keep them from treating you like a peon is acting professional. So sending a long rambling email, having a cell sheet or a video cell sheet that look like that looks like a kindergartner did it, um, saying things like we're going to get rich together, or if we only sell 1% of the market, blah, 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 things like that. Um, the things that irritate them, um, other things that irritate companies is, a lot of companies have told Stephen and myself that um, up to 80% of the products that they see from inventors are already out there. And it, you can imagine, you're this marketing manager, the inventor sending you something, and you either know it already exists or you Google it, Google image it for 30 seconds. I do this all the time with inventors. And I'm like, what's this? And they're like, oh, I didn't know that existed. I'm like, you need to get on Google Images and search. So um, just by being professional, that's how you get them not to treat you like a peon, um, Paula, as you put it. You said it, not me, so I can repeat it. Um, and what I can say is in the 20 years that we've been doing event, right, with students in over 65 countries, uh, we haven't had one of our students get knocked off that I know of from a company that they had submitted to. And the reason why I firmly believe that's the case is because our students conduct themselves professionally and most inventors don't. And that's also why when you conduct yourselves professionally, you will stand out amongst all these other inventors and they'll want to get more ideas from you. And so there's a lot of inventors making you guys look bad out there. Maybe you guys are some of those inventors making us look bad, but um, you know, uh, be professional. Uh, that's, that's my best solution, Paul. Okay, uh, yeah, this is an interesting question from Jordan. Uh, looking to start alt to license, but my current employer has a contract, an NDA, and IP ownership agreement that seems to say the company owns any ideas I come up with as long as I'm employed. Any advice? Um, okay, so what I can say is I think California cracked down on this quite a bit with employers on the behalf of inventors, where, you know, 
they were kind of saying some employers were saying, you know, we own your butt, any idea you come up with. But if a company's making microchips and you come up with a kitchen gadget, should they own that idea? No. So, so my answer is, uh, Jordan, you have to look at your employment agreement and how restrictive that is. I know in California, they can't own your butt on anything you come up with. Now that's a non-specific, non-legal response, but um, so you have to read through it and see if you can invent in other areas. Um, and again, everything that I'm telling you tonight is not legal advice. Seek the services of an attorney if you're looking for legal advice. This is just uh, general business advice and, and seek uh, advice from an advisor um, before you take action on anything. So um, yeah, I, 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 that just sits really poorly with me. Um, I had inventors that were so mad about that. They're like, well, I'm going to leave. And I've had, again, I'm not telling you what to do here, but I've had inventors just tell me, um, well, geez, I'm in the microchip business. I have this kitchen gadget. I'm going to do what I want. And I have never heard back from one of them that said it caused a problem for them. I'm not telling you to do that. I'm just telling you that inventors have told me that's what they did. And I've never known of one that got in trouble for that. So, uh, you know, that's just my personal experience. Um, Falona. Hi, Andrew. Can you license? Hi, Falona. Can you license the same product with multiple companies at the same time? Also, how much does a product idea? Okay, let's just answer that one. Can you license uh, the product with the multiple companies at the same time? So this is my, I answer this all the time, but I think it's a common question. Basically, if they're not stepping on each other's toes, I'm not going to stick my feet up. You guys don't want to see my feet. If they're not stepping on each other's toes, um, yeah, you probably can. So there are definitely cases where it makes sense to license to multiple companies. It could be in different geographies. It could be a variation in a different distribution channel. But if they're selling on the same shelf at Walmart, it makes no freaking sense. You know, now here's, the, here's what a lot of you are thinking when, um, when you say that. What you're really thinking is, well, if I license it to three companies, I'll make more money. And that's not necessarily true. If you license to a big company that's selling 200,000 units a year, you know, that's, you're being greedy. If you think that you need to license to another one that's also selling in Walmart and Target or wherever it's selling, it, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't give them a unique selling position, right? Now, if there's a product variation, let's say one is for sporting goods, but you got a variation of your product that is for physical therapy. And the company that you license to, and you, you work this out when you talk to them, they're like, oh, we want worldwide, everywhere, everything. And they're like, well, you're kind of just selling us sporting goods. And I would like to retain the rights for a physical therapy product. You don't have any distribution selling physical therapy products anywhere. So I would like to retain the rights to that. And it's something that you negotiate. Um, I would say the lar a large percentage of products, you're not going to be licensing to multiple companies. And without disclosing what your invention is and on here, I, I, I would need to talk about that specific product because it varies. But what I can say is if they're not stepping on each other's toes, you should probably consider pulling pieces out of it so that you can license to other companies as long as they're not stepping on each other's toes. Um, let's see. Fred. Is the gardening industry a good industry for open innovation? Yeah, I think it is. I think that um, I'm not, I don't see as much new there as I would like to see, but I think it's a huge market because um, you get a lot of people that are getting older and are in the U.S. the population is aging. And a good percentage of people like to take up gardening um, when they retire or have more time on their hands. So I see it as a, a definitely, without a doubt, one of the growing fields. Um, I see that people struggle with coming up with really innovative things in that area. I know that when I went to the hardware show last time, there's a whole massive um, area that's just gardening. And I look at a lot of the stuff and a lot of it's kind of decorative. Um, of course, there's things like the garden weasel and different tools and, you know, things you can sit on and maybe things that help you grow. I mean, if you want to get into like there's topsy turvy where you hang your tomatoes upside down, that was a deer TV product. So um, and it's not gardening, gardening product for, you know, really hardcore gardeners. But I think there's a lot of opportunity there. So I think it's a great category to invent. And that was uh, Fred. 
So yeah, I would, I'd recommend it highly. Um, Julie says, what do you think about other inventors who offer to help manufacture or license? They say they know this person or that person and are very well connected. Um, there's nothing wrong with it per se, but first off, I would say, okay, what if you help people license? And if they say nothing, then move it on, okay? Um, also, I don't think it makes sense to get wrapped up with somebody that's just basically gonna use their existing contacts and approach one or two companies when really your list for your dog toy should be 30. So that would just not be a smart move on your part. So um, I, 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 I'm not a big, you gotta say, so what have you done? So, okay, you did a, let's say it's pet. You did a pet product. How many product, pet products have you licensed? And if they're like, uh, uh, well, there you go. Um, so I think that it's so easy for you guys to go direct to these companies. Um, you're disempowering yourself when you still feel like you need somebody else to do it for you. You don't need that. You can reach out to that. If they say, well, I got connections at XYZ company, just go on LinkedIn, reach out to that marketing manager, or give them a call. Like, why do you need them? You don't. Um, and you definitely don't want to get tied up with some so-called agent with their two connections with two companies. Um, now what you could do is if you show it to everybody and nobody's interested and you go, well, okay, I'll let you show it to those two companies for three months, but you have the rights just to those two companies. If I license anybody else, that's mine. And you know, a lot of these people that do this, they're actually trying to sell you services. as Well, I'm not going to mention anybody by name, but they're trying to sell you services. They're saying they want to agent you kind of, but they're really, it's a ploy to sell you services or to get you wrapped up. And then once you've committed to them in the contract and they're asking for more money, it's, it's just a mess. Steven and I and InventRight is all about you going direct to companies and nothing else. So not a big fan of that. Um, uh, good fella says, I can use handwriting to describe my drawings or type out the description. Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't know if you're, you're saying that's in place of a sell sheet or a video sell sheet. If that's the case, good fella, I would say don't do that. I would say you need some sort. And, and you know, doing hand-drawn sketches and then having a description, that's not really professional. Um, so if that's what you're, I'm not, I don't know if that's what you're saying, good fella. I just want everybody to benefit from the question and my answer. Um, I, I don't do like rough sketches and then do a description of your product. You need to do a marketing piece. You need to make it look like an advertisement for their customer, not for them, but for their customer. That might not be what you're getting at, but you didn't give me enough to go on. So that was a good, good comment. Um, hi, Andrew. My name is Augustine. Um, I found very, my middle name is August, by the way. This is my grandfather's name. It's completely irrelevant. <laughs> I thought I'd get your guys' attention. I found it very difficult to get my product marketing material to companies, creative development department. Is there an easier way? Uh, yeah, Augustine, you're going to the wrong department. You, you, you don't want to go to their creative development department. I don't think most companies even have that. Um, you mean, you, maybe you're talking about like industrial design, product development. That might be what you're referring to. Um, I would always go to marketing managers. So change that up. You're going to the wrong department. The industrial design department or product development department, if they even call it that, um, they got a kind of a, not all of them by any means, but some of them have a chip on their shoulder. And they're like, oh, yeah, they want to prove you wrong. So the marketing people, they glom onto it and go, ooh, we can sell this. And then they might show it to the industrial design people or the engineers. But so you're going to the wrong department. That's your problem. Um, so hopefully that helps. Uh, so we got about 11 minutes left. P, P -ra. Uh, I've done my PPA in January. Should I pitch it to companies or do the utility pad? If pitching is best, what is the best way? So no, I mean, you, if you haven't shown it to anybody, P -ra, and you did your provisional in January, why would you file a full utility pad? It makes no sense. You know, so, you know, you could file, if you haven't shown it to anybody, you could file that same provisional today and get a whole year from today. Now you won't be protected from January, 
Well, what are the chances that somebody comes up with it between January and now? That is a risk. People worry about that all the freaking time. Never seen it happen. I'm sure it's happened to somebody. Never happened to one of our students. So, but don't run out and file a patent because you feel like it's going to run out. Well, first off, you got all the way till January. So you could not file an additional provisional. And you got all the way till January to get some interest and get the company to pay for the patent. So why would you file a utility patent? It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so you asked if, if pitching is best, what's the best way? A sell sheet or a video sell sheet? A one page advertisement for your product or a short 30 to 60 second video? Uh, underdog, is, is the name InventRight registered trademark? Yes, it is now, but it wasn't. We've been around for 20 years and it was only, I think about a year ago that we got registered, but it was a common law trademark. So that's a, a tip for you guys and your inventions. If you put TM on it, you actually, you can see that we, the banner says TM right behind me. Um, and we haven't updated it because I don't care. So when you use a mark in commerce, if anybody wanted to do invention coaching and they want to call invent right, even if we never filed a registered trademark, we'd blow them out of the water. We could show advertising pieces and our marketing for 20 years that use the word invent right in relation to business coaching and invention coaching. So, you know, most of you, again, not legal advice, but our students, we don't tell them to run out and file a registered trademark. See, put the TM there, it's free. Put a little circle around it. Puts people on notice you intend on using it. Could that bite you in the butt? It could. Never has with any of our students. Most of the time, it'll bite you in the butt if you spend all the money on the registered trademark because most of the time, they're not interested in the name and they'll want to name it something else. So, But if you're really worried about it, go ahead and register it. It costs quite a few bucks. But yeah, so um, InventRight is only registered. Don't quote me on it. Year, year and a half. I forget. I mean, the banner still says TM there, not R. Um, Let's see. Okay, I love this question. This is from Fred. What is the best way to study the market? So study the micro category of your invention. And guys, if there's anything I say tonight, this is the most important thing. People don't do it. You're afraid you're going to find something similar. And I'll tell you, most times you won't. And if you do, then you'll, you've been thinking about it for a long time, so go around. Now, you'll find things that are similar, but it's not common that you'll find the exact same thing. Um, you know, I mean, I told you earlier, companies say they find the exact same thing. I, I think why, I think, the, I think I need to rephrase that. It doesn't happen to our students once they're a student of ours, but it happens to inventors all the time. So you should thoroughly study the marketplace. So if you're doing, um, if you're doing a corkscrew opener, a wine bottle opener, you need to get on Google Images and you need to look at every wine bottle opener you can find. Get on Amazon too. My favorite is though Google Images. And you'll find all sorts of stuff. You'll find stuff that maybe is on a blog. It isn't even selling, but it exists somehow. Somebody's talking about it. And you know, and your, your goal when you study the marketplace, if you already have the idea, is not, it is not to prove that your product doesn't exist at all. Not at all, a little bit. So what you wanna do is you wanna look at the, the landscape. Here are all the wine bottle openers. Well, you got the electric ones, you got the, the you know, do it by hand ones, you got the totally manual ones, you got these different types. And you, they have these benefits, you look at their marketing, look at it, because you're gonna be using a lot of the same marketing in your own sell sheet, you're gonna change it up a bit. And so you're killing like two birds with one stone here. Look at the marketing, look at the price points and go, how does my product fit in? Does it fit in the middle here? Is it kind of like these 10 other products over here, but I've got a nice point of difference. So I'm not upset that there's 10 products that are somewhat similar and I know they're selling. So it verifies that they're selling and I've got this point of difference. So you're not looking to prove there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it and never ever say that to me or a coach, an event right coach or a company ever. Never say there's nothing like it. There's always something like it, 100% of the time. It might be a completely different product, but it solves the same problem or et cetera, et cetera. I could go into detail. People love to argue with me on that one. 
but I, I could blow any product out of the water, any product, and say there is something like it. They do, it does have competitors, it does have this or that. So you're just trying to look, so Google Images is the, is the answer there. Um, yeah, that's, that's the answer. Study Google Images. And when you're new to it, you're gonna kind of suck at the keywords. You know, I've been doing this forever, so I'll type in some words and I'll find anything. I'll type in some different words and I'll find a ton. And so it's kind of like patent searching too. You're gonna find some stuff. You're gonna pull off some words like, oh, I found something like that product's kind of the same thing. Oh, they're using that word. Okay, now I'm gonna search that word. So have fun with it. Most inventors have tremendous anxiety about it. Have fun with it. And the sooner you can do that searching when you come up with the idea, the less anxiety you have because the less attached will be to the product and the more likely it will be to change the product if necessary. Now, let's say you find the exact same freaking thing. Exactly the same. You've been thinking about this thing for six months, a year, two years. Don't give up. Go, okay, I'm going to study the micro category of all the wine bottle openers. You know, and then maybe it'll just come to you like the next day in the shower or a week later driving in the car and you're like, I know what I could change. You know, so if you do find the exact same thing, keep going. Now, at some point you're like, mm, you can't come up with anything new. There's three of these things out there already. Okay, moving on to the next idea. And hopefully you haven't gone and blown a bunch of money on a patent or something, you know. Um, okay, so we've got about five minutes left. Um, Jeff, any, any advice on working on multiple projects simultaneously? Yeah, a lot of our students will come back for another term just to get tweaked in for that. You have to be very efficient. We don't let our students at the very beginning work on multiple projects out of the gate. So we say, look, during your six months, if you're motivated and you want to work on a second or third, absolutely. At the beginning, only one. Get through the whole thing. Get the calls in. You don't have to be done or have closed a deal. Then you can work on another project, um, put another project in your pipeline. So for the sake of like of visuals here, this is what you could do. You could do it any way you want. But Jeff, what you could do is go, okay, you have, let's say you have project number one, project number two, and project number three, okay? So on project number one is your oldest project. So on Monday and Tuesday, or maybe just Monday, because it doesn't take a long time to follow up. Monday, you're like doing nothing else, on discipline, I'm going to follow up on LinkedIn and phone calls on my project number one. Now, on project number two, I'm not ready to call yet, but I've got, um, I need to finish up my sell sheet. I need to finish out my list of companies. So you start working on that. Maybe that's two days, three days maybe, okay? And then, you're oh, project number three, because you like to jump around a little bit. And um, on this one, you know, I'm just studying to see if I should even work on this project, okay? Weekends out. Monday rolls around, project number one again. Then Tuesday and Wednesday, project number two. And then whatever. whatever. So you have to be very disciplined. I also think that when you have multiple projects, um, I'm talking with one of our former students right now on um, developing a, a CRM, a relationship management system that we can give to our students. But you can just use one on your own as well. Um, you, you really have to keep track of that stuff. I see, I have plenty of students that will just keep track of it. They're very good with Excel. It can get a little unwieldy, um, but you need to keep track of when your follow-ups. Some people just literally have an index, a box of index cards, and it will have the days one through 31 of the month, and then maybe the next 15 days of the next month. And if you're like, and it's this simple, and you take the index card, and you call them the day, and you write a note, call them on the 5th, and you put it on the 5th, and then when you get to the 5th, you're looking in your index card box. This is the most crude way. And you're like, oh, these are the people I need to call today. So that's like bare bones, like, um, but organized. And that's old school. Um, some people use Excel spreadsheets and others will use uh, relationship management. So they're called CRMs, customer relationship management systems, um, Outlook. And there's a whole bunch of free ones out there. Um, and some of them are kind of cool. They'll even track if people looked at your email. They'll have the, you can also get software to plug in to, um, your email system, especially Google, and it'll track if the person looked at it or not, all sorts of things. So you need to get a lot more efficient, but don't come out of the gate with two or three projects. You need to have gone through one completely before you, for us, with our students, before you earn the right to work on multiple. But in the long run, that's a recipe for success. So um, be very organized. 
Uh, my advice to you, Jeff, work on one first before you work on multiple, but then you can work on multiple. And working on multiple simple projects is one thing, but working on multiple complex projects is another. So, you know, some, you know, some of you just have complex stuff and that's what you want to work on. But if you have complex stuff and you'd be equally happy working on a simple one, work on a simple one, you know? And uh, yeah. So let's see. So we can do a last one here. Sure. Sharish. Uh, greetings, Andrew. I have a couple of commercially marketable great ideas which will generate big income when licensed. I wonder if I can work with your company as partners to make real quick deals. Um, in 20 years, we've never partnered with one of our students. It'd be weird. We'd like partner with some students and not with others. We, we, we kind of are your partner when we coach and mentor you. So, But we do not team up with inventors and do the work for you. Um, or say, oh, we're not going to charge you for coaching, and then we'll just do it for the royalties that you earn. Um, so we, uh, you know, and to make real quick deals, there is no such thing as a real quick licensing deal, especially if they're really big companies you're working with. The average licensing deal from the time you show interest to the time you close the deal with our students, the average is three months and could be shorter, could be longer. So if you're looking to make a quick buck, don't do licensing. You can make a lot of freaking money, but you know, it takes a company three to nine months to launch a product and you get royalties every three months. So, you know, most of the time you're not going to see money for, for a year or a little bit more. And most of our students, our students are level headed. They're okay with that. They're like, damn, a big company is going to sell my idea and they're going to take all the risk and do all the work. Psh, yeah, that's a, I'm okay with that, Andrew. But it's, we do not sell get rich quick and we never will. Because there's a lot of these people selling get-rich-quick courses on the internet, not, not inventing, but other stuff. It leaves a bad taste in Stephen and my mouth. We'll never do that. Never have people holding up giant checks or bragging about how much money they made. That's garbage. Um, that's just, we, we, we don't do that. We don't sell that way. And we don't really have to. Most of the people that become students of ours, vast majority of them, this is part of who they are. And they don't really know it, but... But having done this so long, it's part of who they are. We're helping them become the inventor that they want to be and actually get it out and stop just dreaming stuff up, but actually get out in front of companies. And the money is secondary. Don't get me wrong. Everybody's interested in the money, but seeing their product in the store shelves, they, they don't even articulate or say it, but I just know it is that's more important than making a million bucks or something, you know, and those are the people I want to help because it's a total cliche, but you do what you love. The money will come. I, I believe that. And you have a work ethic. You do what you love and you have a work ethic and the money will come. And even though licensing is 1,000th the work of starting your own company, it's still work. It's not no work. So, uh, Sharish, uh, there is no quick licensing deal. I mean, yeah, have we seen some? Sure, we have. But um, you're in the wrong mindset. And so I hope you don't mind me saying that. I hope you get in the right mindset. But no, we're not going to sell it for you. We're going to coach and mentor you. It's amazing all the way through, including the negotiation. You know, I'll help you through all of it. But we're going to be putting the work on your back and we'll tell you what to do. So you'll just seem super sharp to the companies you work with. Um, I really, I really enjoyed answering your guys' questions. There's always way too many. Um, I tried to mix it up. Those are a lot of different questions, you know, because I've done so many of these. For those of you that want to go back, I don't know how many, Madeline, I don't know what time this is, the eighth or ninth time I've done it. I lose track. But you can watch other ones. You can watch it. I talk pretty fast, so I try to boom, boom, boom with the answers. It's all, you know, I don't think there's any fluff tonight. I don't think I, I, I sugarcoat things or, you know, I, I think I like, I pride myself in being direct to the point. It might make it not as, like, entertaining, but it's going to give you guys what you need. And that's what we're all about at Invent Right. So um, remind everybody, thank you for all the thank yous. Sharish, thank, thank you. Yeah, I, I understand. Sharish said he can't afford our program. But I would buy our book, One Simple Idea, Sharish. Keep watching the YouTube. I totally understand. That's totally fine. We do have an academy program that's about 900 bucks instead of the 3000 for the boot camp. 
Um, in the boot camp, we let you make payments. So that might be something that you look into if you can afford 900. It's not one-on-one -on -one coaching, it's group coaching, but um, Austin, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, uh, Health man, thank you. Um, David, you're very welcome. So um, thank you, Time Lizard, great live stream. I like all the emoticons too. Although, Time Lizard, it looks like your emoticon looked like you were yawning and then you gave a A-OK. -okay. You said it was great. I, I won't be insulted, don't worry. Uh, thanks, Andrew from Lazarus. Ed, Edmund, hey, Edmund. Ed Urban, terrific info. And Ed's, a, Ed's a, a reoccurring student of ours, so he knows his stuff. So it's very flattering that you'd bother to listen to me ramble, Ed. You know it all by now. Um, Jordan, thank you. Hurrah, thanks. Oh, Joanne says, I have all your InventRight books. Cool. Yeah, make sure you get Stephen's new book. Oh, real quick, um, tomorrow night, we have um, Jim from Hangman Products, one of our students licensed to them. They're a hardware company, mostly focused on picture hanging stuff. And so um, I don't know if you want to throw that link in there, um, uh, Madeline, if you want to throw that in the chat. If not, we'll, uh, we'll throw it in the comments. There you go. Uh, webinar tomorrow night. We'll, we'll throw it in the we'll throw it in the comments there. So make sure to check that out. That should be good. He's uh, he's he's a great guy. There you go. So remind everybody to take care, keep inventing, and we'll catch up with you next time. See ya. Bye.